Welcome to the number one independent podcast in the fucking world. This is Black Opinions Matter, B-O-M-M. It comes to you on the Count the Dings Network. We are wholly independent. We started it out of the basement of our garage. That's right. Our garages have basements. And we did it. And now we're doing it. And now you're listening to it. My name's Amin. I'm joined, as always, by Big Jerv, Black Trey, and Big Waz, Rob Lopez on the production. We have a packed show today, man. We got a lot of stuff to get to. Benny the Butcher's got a new album out. We're going to talk about that. That abortion of a TV show called Lovecraft Country had its season finale. We'll talk about that and ask some questions. I know Jerv's got some questions about it. Jerv, so do I. We're talking about Good Lord Bird. That is the Showtime show about John Brown, the abolitionist. I love that show. We'll talk about that. Ice Cube out here tricking some other funny stuff, but we start with a really quick topic, guys. I just want to know something. Is there like a fucking deal going on about going to Tulum? Because I shit you not, in the last month, there are at least 15 people I know who are either going to Tulum, been to Tulum, or in Tulum right now. And Tulum is a place that I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I haven't heard a whole lot about it up until probably 2019. And since 2019, I hear a lot of people going, but literally in the last month, no less than 15 people I know have gone to Tulum or are going to Tulum or in Tulum right the fuck now. And so, you know, I look to y'all because you guys probably being younger, being more easily be able to travel. You know, me and Jerry, we got kids, so traveling places ain't for vacation. And so that ain't something that happens easily for us. So really, this question is for Trey and Waz. The fuck is going on in Tulum? Why everybody going? Um, it's a couple of things that that are happening at once, right? I think Tulum had sort of become a newer destination, quote-unquote, exotic locale in the recent years. Like, it had been, you know, Cancun and Cabo, you know, which was, the you know, obviously the more adult, fancier version of a Mexican getaway. But Tulum was becoming the sort of hipster um, vacation getaway, right? It was like, oh, if you really, really know, you're going to Tulum, right? And I think this started happening for a few years now. But then I think what you're seeing, I mean, is that Tulum had already become trendy and Mexico was the last place that people could go on vacation. Like your American passport was basically worth as much as toilet paper in places like Europe and other places. So because people can't go to like people, of course, notice nobody posted all of them white buildings in Greece this summer. Right, <laughs> like yeah. remember that was the thing. Mykonos used to be Mykonos, <laughs> yeah, Mykonos used to be the Tulum. No rice, there was a no right. champagne, no right. nothing. Right, you notice but you also, ain't seen not one of those this summer, and I think Tulum sort of took the place for all of those spots um, right. this summer. But also, Waz, you can get to Tulum for one hundred eighty-eight dollars. Facts, facts. So you know, yes, Jerv, you can get there for the very <laughs> low, that's, low that's price. That's interesting. So. If you want sandy beaches, if you want tequila in your in your cup, if you want to speak to a person that don't know English, get you also, a flight to Tulum. Also, Nigga, you, just, the- you just described Miami Beach, by the way. <laughs> also, um, which, Bob, again, you know, my... <laughs> We know what New Yorkers do to South Beach. That's, that, that's like the they, they only that's the only well black New York anyway, black and Dominican New York. That's the only tropical locale they can think of that isn't DR or PR. It's always like, yo, let's go to freaking Miami. Like like that's the um that's the number one thing. And I think another thing that people don't realize about Tulum as well is that even when Mexico quote unquote closed the border between us, uh, closed our border. Um, you could still fly. If you were flying, you could still get in, right? Like, it was closed to people who were trying to drive through to Mexico. But you could fly, even at the height of the pandemic, you could fly into Mexico. So even when it was a quarantine and the border was closed, Tulum was open for business. So I think that's why you've seen um, all of these Tulum joints. But I do want to tell our listeners, if you are planning on going to Tulum, be careful, bro. Like, the cops out there... 
I heard is crooked as hell. They gonna tax your ass. What? Yeah, yeah, They're yeah, yeah. I heard police people officers. Get, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard these people getting taxed by the cops or the federal, whatever the whoever the the government, you know, sort of police are over there. People getting taxed. Like they'll go, they'll drive through a checkpoint. And the person be like, "You ain't getting paid. You did X Y. You broke X Y and Z law. One hundred fifty dollars." Or whatever, whatever, whatever. So be careful, all you guys going to Tulum, man. Uh, just watch your ass is what I'll say. Yo, you know what, what's funny is um, now that you describe it like that, now it makes all the sense in the world why I wouldn't know because I don't have an American passport. So for me, like, travel anywhere is like an adventure. I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit, we got to go to England. Fuck. So that makes a lot more sense. Right. That's crazy. By the way, Jerv, I saw the look in your eye, man. Do not bring your child to Tulum. Man. Nah, I'm good. That's my nah. number one pet peeve about, nah. about Miami Beach is when I be sitting there outside of the, the Lebatar Studios at the Clevelander Hotel, you know. It's after the show. I'm getting me a little drink. And I look on the sidewalk, and I see people with a stroller. And I'm like, why would you bring your child to this, man? Nothing about this is family friendly. <laughs> Come on. People bring their kids to Vegas, I mean, hey, which is even worse. Vegas, Vegas, though, man. You could do Vegas, though. I, I can understand Vegas because there's shows and shit like that. So, like, what show are you taking your kid to see in Vegas? You taking your kid to see Cirque du Soleil? I'll be honest with you, bro. I, as many times I've been to Vegas, I've never seen a fucking show. I don't want to see a show. <laughs> so, I can't, I got nothing for you or what show I would take. No, but, but I but, feel but like to your like, point, Jerv, people do that, though. People do do the show thing, like, you know, people do go see Britney Spears or whatever when she had her little residency and all that. People do it. But but I actually, like you, Jerv, been to Vegas many times now. Never been to a show. I went to like a, a hypnotist comedian show one time. And I won't lie, that, that <laughs> nigga was, was funny. Late. <laughs> that nigga was funny, man. I was like, this is a good time. But like, you know, I just can't imagine bringing a child into that environment. I'm like, first of all, like, I'm assuming you come in here because you want to let loose. You want to cut loose. <laughs> you didn't want to cut loose. You would have gone to Disneyland. But <laughs> even, if it, even if it wasn't, even if, it, if that's the case, even if the case is I can't afford a babysitter, I couldn't find a babysitter, I had to bring the baby. Somebody got to stay home. Somebody got to stay in the room with the baby while I go out and wild out. And then the next night, I'll watch the baby. And then you go out and wild out. But you can't be out here at two in the morning with your baby in a stroller. Like, it's just not a family-friendly environment. But, uh, you know, Tulum, is, I mean, it looks dope. I'd like to go one day. We'll see. Nah, it's dope, and I'm pretty don't sure... Don't bring your kids to Tulum. Don't do don't it. Don't bring your kids to Vegas. Don't bring your kids to Atlanta. Don't bring your kids to... <laughs> don't bring your to kids to Atlanta, son. Listen, don't bring your kids to <laughs> Atlanta. Don't bring your kids, kids to Atlanta, Atlanta, You know what's funny? Son. I could say at least in Atlanta... <laughs> nah, you can bring your kids to Atlanta, yo. I'm just I'm being funny, yeah, man. They got kids they, should be allowed everywhere, but uh, I'm listening on Means Rant. No, not everywhere. Not everywhere. No, not, not everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> not everywhere. The thing, but the, the, no, but to Jerv's point about there being shows and other things, and they do have like, you know, like MGM Grand has the side of the pool shit where they do um, the pool parties at Wet Republic. And then they have the Lazy River, which is both, I guess, adult and kid friendly. Although I don't really think it's kid friendly, but whatever. It's people, not. People do Was, it, right? It's um, nothing but ass cheeks. Ass cheeks and right. titties. <laughs> but, then, but then inside the casino is all kinds of cigarette and cigar smoke. Smoking. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Yo, do they let you smoke weed in the casinos yet? Probably nah. not yet. I'm sure you could probably do a on, vape, it, it depends on if It depends on if Floyd Mayweather is fighting. <laughs> you know, Mayweather fight weekend. That's it's an unru- all the rules it's, yeah, 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 yeah. It's an unruly crowd. <laughs> Um, shout out, shout out the May week, shout out the May weekends in Vegas. I've I've been to a couple of those. Those those are excellent times. Thanks again for listening, Bomb. As you guys know, if you're loyal listeners, we've introduced a lot of new shows over the last few months. Crazy, sexy, cool, growing up the same. Wednesday service, obviously, woke bros is still around too. And this show, Bomb, the OG show. Guess what? This Wednesday, that's right, Wednesday, October twenty first, nine p.m. Eastern. We are doing a surprise live show. We're going to have all your old favorites 
as well as all these new voices. We're going to do it over Zoom. We're going to give it for free to all our Patreons. If you are a Patreon, look for the Zoom link coming your way Wednesday, October 21st, 9 p.m. Eastern. The bomb slash count the dings live show. If you are not a Patreon, patreon.com slash count the dings is where you can sign up. Man, we got uh, membership package plans that'll fit your budget. It's totally worth it. We give you a lot of extra content, the overflow podcast episodes and uh, some videos. And of course, this live show coming October 21st, 9 p.m. If you're listening to this on Tuesday, after this episode drop tomorrow, basically, this thing is going down. So make sure you are a Patreon, patreon.com slash count the things and come check us out. You get all your old favorites and you get some of the new fam as well, only for the true ones. So I want I, I do want to get to Ice Cube joining the League of Extraordinary Coonery. But before we do that, uh, I do want to talk about something that happened to me today. Um, I was talking to Trey. We we're talking business on the phone, you know, good stuff, encouraging stuff on the phone with Trey. And I'm in the middle of telling him this story, and he's like, I could sense, you know, a second before he said, I could sense he was kind of like, yeah, yeah, he's trying to jump in because he's trying to tell me something. And so I had that one pause. He said, Yo, I got to get off the phone because I got to talk, I got to get on this call about a Super Bowl spot. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, this nigga big time the shit out of me. And it made me think, first of all, I'm proud of Trey. I'm happy for his success. But I won't lie, that that level of big time I was not expecting for at least until he got to New York. I didn't think it would be like months before he set foot in New York and got his first pair of Carhartts. <laughs> that, he would, that he would shit on me ever so eloquently like nigga i'm busy with some real multi-million dollar shit uh i don't have time for your stories but it got me thinking what is the biggest or the funniest or the worst time you've been big time what is the biggest or funniest or the worst time you've been big time as always at bomb podcast b-o-m-m podcast at john gervais at trayvon at Big Waz at Darth Amin. Tweet oh. us. Let us know. What is the biggest or funniest or worst time you've ever been big time? I just told you uh, uh, my good friend, Black Trey, <laughs> big time the fuck out of me. Super smooth, too. And then he did the, he started laughing. Ha ha. Nah, man. Nah. I was like, man, I know what I've been big time. You can't fix that one. <laughs> So uh, I'm looking around. Why does you look like you've got I've, one? Yeah, I got one. I've actually, I might, I've shared this on one of our pods before. I don't think it was Black Opinions Matter, motherfucker. Um, but uh, um, so <laughs> there was this girl that I was dating a long, long time ago, right? And um, whatever, we broken up, but we was we had a bunch of mutual friends, and it was years after, and we were still cool. <laughs> And I remember sort of we we had gotten into a conversation at a party maybe or something at a get together or whatever. And we're just talking. And she told me that she was dating Kid Cudi, which in and of itself is a, you know, it's like a wow. <laughs> I'm fucking with Kid Cudi now, right? <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you know, I'm not fucking you. with what that is is I'm not fucking with your broke ass. Exactly, yeah, is. yeah, yeah. Big, big, big. I don't want your broke ass no more energy. Um, mm. and then you know to make matters worse, so that's already a, like I'm stunting on you. She was like, Scott said he wants to marry me. Oh, I said no. I. I said, called him Scott. Hey, as soon as she said Scott, <laughs> my nigga, she listen. I she said, belonged to the. I said yo. You got it. You got it. You got it. I, I, I said, I said, I said, wow. I was just like, wow. Like, wow. Like you really going for it right now. Okay, cool. You got it. Um, you know, fast forward, however many years ago that was, um, they did not end up getting married. <laughs> oh, shocker. I'm sure Scott you guys would be shocked to learn that. But yeah, I did in that moment. I felt like I was being big time. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm past you, brother. Yeah, you didn't have to feel it. It happened. That's what <laughs> so happened. for me, 
Trey. Listen, for me, Trey, what you got? first of all, I don't know where I picked up that like, nah, man, you got it. Maybe it's just a black thing because, you know, black people are always trying to dumb down anything that they're doing. And I didn't technically big time a meme, man. He tried to make it seem that way because we were talking about something very important, but I just called in a small window and I didn't think that conversation was going to like really happen. And I had to do it at the top of the hour. And I was like, yo, I'm going to call you right back. But the last line just kind of made him go, ah! And I know how I mean it is because like I mean to make that look. But for some big time shit, like I always deal with homies that love to one up each other, like on some wild shit. And I've seen Waz one up his partners too, like, like on some funny shit. But like overall, man, uh, I'm going to piggyback off Waz's story and just say this, this chick, if you're having a party or whatever. And she was like, yeah, man, um, can you get me an Uber XL home? So I ain't even dating this chick. She just like, can you get me an Uber X home well, from, Uber X is, from the valley like, to LA? Wait, Uber X or Uber X? No, nah, in Uber. LA the chicks only ride Uber XL. Uber. It's a mandatory thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yo, so, I, ho- I hope a Honda Odyssey pulls listen, up. So, so listen, she like, can you get the Uber? So I'm thinking like, let me just even just look, bro. It was two hundred fifteen dollars to get her to the crib at one thirty a.m. Oh my lord. And it was literally like down the hill, bro. So I'm like, yeah, nah, this not gonna happen. I'll give you a blanket and a pillow. You can sleep down here on this couch. I'm about to go to bed. So she says, Drake and Future wouldn't do me like this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Hey. But the thing is, she, she really, both? she really, she really know him. So I was like, hey, I'm not them though. Yeah, you so got I it. I don't know what to it. tell you. It's, it's, well, I mean, like, you got it. Here's the thing about a, a big time, right? It doesn't have to. It's not always puffery. Sometimes that's a real thing. Sometimes it's just real. Like that's she really wouldn't have that happen to her when she's dealing with Drake and Future because she really does. Trey really did have to get off the phone to talk about the Super Bowl with somebody. Like that's that's real. He didn't make that up. So big times don't necessarily have to have an element of fakery to it. It could be real, real, but it's also still like kind of a big time, you know? Uh, Jerv, what do you got? And ABJ in Philly, my man uh, said to come to the, uh, my first year at, at ESPN, my man told me to, uh, to come to the ESPN party. He was like, oh, you should be good, this and the third. I'm like, bro, I only been here for like three months. Like, I don't know nobody yet. So he's like, nah, no, don't worry about it. I got you. We'll figure it out. He's, you know, he was somebody in Philly or whatever. And we get there and we're in line and he sees one of his homies. So my man acts out in a way that I've never seen him act before in his life. Like, he's, like, jumping up and down, trying to get homie, like, the, the, the people. And I'm looking like, oh, man, this this ain't it. Like, this this ain't how you cut the line. Like, we look real we look real nutty right now. So not only does he do that, but he, he, he goes out to his bull and he says, yo, we're good. His, he talk, talking to him, this man, his man goes, but what about Jerv? <laughs> Yo, homie doesn't even acknowledge me. Oh, he just it kept it the fuck. You jerk, bro. He just kept it moving. Left me in line, like, it, and, I, and I, you know, I, like I don't let sh- I don't let shit slide. So once you do something like that to me, like I'm I'm cool on you. Like I don't give a fuck what happens the rest of our lives. Like yo, like you stunted on me in public. I'm cool. That's what we not gonna do. I'd have just been better if you'd be like, yo, bro. He can only he can only get me. You got to figure it out. But you just didn't even acknowledge me. So when wow. he saw me inside, you know, I came in the club and, then, you know, he saw me inside. He, You know, uh, I was in, I'm no way in hell. I'm about to go talk to him. I'm I'm, I'm do my own thing. Homie comes over <laughs> to me. He's like, yo, this party's crazy. I'm like, nah, fam. Oh, wow. Nah, and I just kept it moving, yo. I hate man. when they try you're to play You're not going to stun on me in public, bro. Yeah, like no, nah. we're not gonna act like that. And, that yo, but Jerv, but Jerv, salute to you for getting into the party anyway. You know what I'm saying? Because oh, yeah, sure. they had I'm, to respect your handle at the door. You feel me? But your, your man, he he was out of pocket for that one because he was supposed to be like, <laughs> yo, they couldn't save you. I'm gonna flow with them. Or if he was a, if he was a real trooper, he'd be like, fuck that. We gonna finagle the bagel together and do it. You know what I mean? I'm gonna wait for you. We gonna do it together, especially since he's the one that told you to come out. But yeah, that. Was, <laughs> man, oh Lord, yo, have you mercy. T- you told man, me to that's... come out. You could at least just say, "Yo, just come to the front. You gotta just pay at the door." Cool. I'm with that, but don't just leave me in the line looking like a poop putt. 
<laughs> but but you got to look at it like this, Jerv. You know how many people get left outside, bro? Like, hey, I'm going to come back and get you. What? Listen, my, bro. My G. I went I, out. Listen, listen. listen. I'm going to tell you right I've now, had plenty of people tell me they're going to come story. back to get me, and they come back and get me. And I'm saying names. It's 2009. Listen, we going to Guys and Dolls. Brandon had just finished up the uh, Hawks series against the Hawks. Rookie year. We back in L.A., we hype, we like, yeah, you know, it's on. The bouncer already playing big time with us, and you know so, Waz can attest about Brandon Jennings, L.A. Right? bouncers. Brandon Jennings, yeah. yeah. So the bouncer, like, we getting ready to walk up. The bouncer hit us with a stiff worm. He like, man, get your hands up off me. He said, bro, you know who I am? He said, bro, I don't give a fuck. I watch sports. You ain't you don't play for the Lakers. Oh, wow. So he hits us with that, and, you know, the Lakers was actually hot. They were playing in the finals at the time. You know, it was yeah. Boston and uh, in L.A. So we like, damn. So we actually linked up with somebody and he was like, hey, I get four of y'all in. So he said, who are which? He said, oh, man, that's cool. I got four. So he goes one, two, three, four. Why the, the guy, the bouncer guy, lets Brandon in, lets the next dude in, lets the next dude in and cuts me off. Oh, no. So I'm like, Yo. Classic. Yo, Classic yo, yo, what's up? Move. Listen, he hits me. He said, yeah, I said four. But he counted somebody, like, he counted somebody twice. So I'm like, yo. And at that time, I'm calling B. B not answering his phone. I'm stuck outside. And this is the same night Drake album leaked his, his debut. Oh, that's right. So the other homie was parking a car and was supposed to get in. And he walks up and he said, what, man? He said, man, we can't get in? I said, nah, he stopped it at me. He said, man, I'm so embarrassed right now, man. It's C-listers out here. <laughs> he, said, he said, at least, man, I don't feel so bad because danger out here, Timberland, man. And I'm like, I don't know who this is, man. But I'm like, I'm not danger that thirsty. Hands. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not that thirsty to go in the club. So, like, we right around the corner from the crib because we've stayed at the um, Palazzo's. So, I'm like, man, I'm about to mob back to the crib. So, he frustrated because he's not about to get in this spot because it was cracking at that time. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know who all was in there. It was probably everybody in there. But, like, that was, that told me, that taught me a huge lesson about Hollywood, fam. Like, you hot one minute and you not like <laughs> you is you is and for me to be a plus one i probably wasn't even a plus one i'm plus three and for me to get hung up at the right. door it showed me my importance of the club like i don't want to be clubbing that bad for me to just <laughs> you know what i mean trying to spin move and get in there yo i got w one more this didn't happen it's fun having my homie uh he was at a uh, strip club in atlanta and uh like it was one of them clubs where he was a kind of semi-regular so, like, he had this girl, and he was like, he's, you know, hitting her off or whatever, and she dancing. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the song, she, you know, she does the gather, <laughs> you know, they gather their belongings. And she's out, like, oh, yo, where oh, you going? Man. She's like, I got to go. I got to go. And like, there's, you know, she pointed on to the other side. It's like, what? Like, what they got? I got money, too. And she points, <laughs> and my boy looks, and it's Shaq. And my boy was like, yeah, you go ahead, man. <laughs> Like what you gonna do? You you gonna tell him I outspend Shaq? Like, come on, man. I don't have more paper than Shaq. Nah, man. Shaq might make your fucking your quarter, your quarterly um goal might be made tonight off of Shaquille O'Neal. Okay, your quarter. So, yo, so, <laughs> hey man, like sometimes you 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 gotta just you gotta. What's the, how the old song goes? You got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them. And at that time, up know when to fold. My em. boy was like, yep. Yeah, we're 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 done here. All right, enough of the ha ha fun stuff. Let's get into this man Ice Cube, man. This man Ice Cube then got up here and talking about he supports Donald Trump's platinum plan. There's a lot. There's a lot of different ways I can go with this, right? Like he went on Ro Roland Martin show and just looked like a fool when asked very basic questions. He didn't know how to answer. But I want to start with this, man. I think there's nothing that's more offensive than saying we're going to help black people and the way we're going to help them is with this plan and the name of the plan is the platinum plan. Like they are basically calling us jigaboos to our face when they do that, right? <laughs> are we sure Ice Cube didn't name it the platinum I don't plan? Fuck, who named it? You <laughs> named it that. You are calling me a jigaboo. 
<laughs> there, you are calling hey, it's me. It's funny you. having platinum be try to be relevant, like platinum as top tier in 2020. The rose gold plan. You you would you wouldn't have went with the rose gold plan. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, how are we supposed to even get behind something like that? Like, oh, I know what the niggers are like. The platinum plan. <laughs> Hot digga the dog. Give me that platinum, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they love it. Have you listened to their rap music? Right. So beyond that, I think the biggest thing for me was Ice Cube knew when he was going to put his name behind this thing and support it and go on talk shows to talk about it. Him or the people around him had to know Bro, they're going to ask you about this. So you're going to have to be prepared to talk about this and answer these types of questions. It's not that different from what happened for, with Jonathan Isaac, the NBA player for the Orlando Magic, who decided not only was he not going to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt, but he wasn't going to kneel during the anthem. And that's fair. I'm not here to say, yo, nigga, you got to kneel and nigga, you got to wear the shirt. That's cool. But you also have to recognize if I do this, they're going to ask me questions and I have to be prepared to answer. And what happened to Jonathan Isaac was that Taylor Rooks, the, the amazing Taylor Rooks for Bleacher Report, asked him, why you didn't you do it? And his answer was mumbling something about Jesus. And Taylor hit him with the follow up. What does Jesus have to do with Black Lives Matter? And the kid was stuck because he had no fucking idea. He thought bringing up Jesus was enough to lay people off the scent. And I blamed it on the kid, but I blamed it on the people around him. You know that that's what he's going to do. And you let him do it unprepared. And here comes Ice Cube doing the same thing and unable, unable, incapable of answering even the most basic questions or even knowing some of the, the more basic details that if you, you don't have to be involved in making it, if you just read the news stories about it, you'd know. And so Waz, I defer to you as our political consultant. You are the main host. For Woke Bros with Nando and Big Waz, is you can catch that on the Bomb Network every Thursday. Waz, can you explain to me, explain the listeners and to me, like what the fuck is going on with Ice Cube and does he deserve to be on the Pastor Red Hat list? No, I, I think Ice Cube, I would cut Ice Cube a little bit of sh a slack because if you've been listening to his music basically from the start, he's always had like not very sophisticated politics, right? Like this is the same dude. And I think a dude like Ice Cube from where he sits doesn't really see a difference between a Democrat and a Republican. Like he did come up in the era of C. Dolores Tucker and Bill Clinton and Sister Soldier and all of that nonsense that went on with the Democrats, right? Um, obviously, traditionally, especially since Ronald Reagan, who was so like overtly anti-black as to it's not even a, a, be a question. And that's not even to speak of cats like Richard Nixon before him and Barry Goldwater. And, you know, the list goes on of of um, Republicans who run for national office who are hostile to black people in their interests. I think Ice Cube doesn't see a main difference between the two parties. And I think with that thinking, and not that he's right, because obviously he's wrong. If you're, you know, if you are listening to what we do, you know, we certainly don't feel that way. Um, but I think that informs his decision to be like, look, we came, we came at the Biden campaign who I think justifiably was like, I mean, sure, bro. Like if, if or when we get into office, we'll think about, some, we'll maybe consider some of this stuff, essentially telling them like, all right, we have big, better, th bigger and better things to think about than Ice Cube's plan to save black America. Um, and he took it to Donald Trump and he was like, look, like our shit fell on deaf ears over there. And this guy was willing to listen to us. Um, and again, we can get into how Donald Trump is essentially every single black face that has come into his orbit. He's used it as a manipulation and as a way to be like, look at my Negro. Look, I got plenty of Negroes. I'm not racist. I'm not bigoted. I'm not any of that. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, and we and we talked about Pastor Red Hat, uh, Mr. Mr. West. His wife did meet with Donald Trump and his wife got somebody out of prison. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if Ice Cube came out of this and did something, you know, that was fruitful or worthwhile. Like if, you know, if, if he if he told me he got Mamia um, 
um uh um pardoned or he did something dope for people sure i i just think ice cube is just not very politically sophisticated and it shows with this plan and it shows in his response and just how this is all played out shows that you know and we're going to talk about the john brown show afterwards and, and on the show they referred to frederick Douglass as the king of the negroes um ice cube has proven himself unworthy <laughs> of the job of king of the negroes which he tried to do with this by the way uh some other news uh you know last or was it two weeks ago we talked about armenia and what's happening there i don't know if you guys saw this he was uh trump was at a rally and uh there were some armenians in the crowd and he's, he went on this like Two minute, three minute thing of love fest. Oh, I love Armenians and Armenians are great at business. Armenians are this, Armenians are that. He never actually talked about the one thing that would have meant the most to Armenians. Why would he? Right? Which is, but it's funny to me that Armenians, some Armenians are like, yeah, see, he loves us. Well, no, I mean, like, and this is not a secret. Most of the Armenians in LA are right wing as hell. They are I, Republican as all hell. Get it, like, but- they. That's what they about. So the idea that they would be tr- uh, rooting for the, their president um, shouldn't surprise any of us in the least. But that's neither here nor there. That's a topic for another I, I bring day. that up uh, actually for, for something else. Because today, today we're recording this on Monday. And on, uh, on, on Monday, Trump tweeted, Great news, the new government of Sudan, which is making great progress. Agreed to pay $335 million to U.S. terror victims. By the way, he put million in caps, like, so that we don't get it confused with thousand. I don't know. Uh, To U.S. terror victims and families. Once deposited, I will lift Sudan from the state sponsors of terrorism list. At long last, justice for the American people and a big step for Sudan. And I got asked this question, like, how do you feel about this? And I said, I'm going to be honest, like, this is the kind of shit that you do when you are just basically trying to say, see, I do this stuff. Because here's the stuff. First of all, Sudan has long cooperated with the United States government, even before we had a, a government shift, even when we are under a regime that was guilty of harboring terrorism and all that. They changed their tune about seven, eight years ago and started cooperating. So that's one thing. Second thing is obviously a government does not represent its people when it's doing that kind of stuff. Third thing is that government was overthrown. If you're saying dumb dudes love terrorism, yeah, we overthrew that motherfucker without any help from the United States, by the way, without any help from anybody, through uh, peaceful protests. So automatically, you know, like, okay, the people who are responsible for that are gone. So there's no need to blackmail a country that is in economic ruin into basically proving that they're good. They're making a poor country pay $335 million that is desperately needed for infrastructure and for people who are literally dying of poverty and starvation. Um, and instead, we're paying it to the U.S. For, uh, for stuff that literally none of us are responsible for and the people who are responsible for have been deposed and held accountable for. But the big thing is, and this is the thing that, hasn't been mentioned i don't think or maybe it has been mentioned in the news the expectation is they want sudan also as a condition of this to normalize relations with israel i'm not here to get into arab israeli politics or anything like that uh for the longest Mm. time i've I've often said that much of the stuff that israel does while detestable really has nothing to do with sudan and many of the people that sudanese people claim to be like, um, you know, those are our brothers or whatever. They don't look at us the same way. That's not like Lebanese <laughs> people, Palestinian people. And I'm not talking about, obviously, not uh, sweeping with a broad brush, but like, there's a lot of racism in those countries or racism from those people towards Sudanese people. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm always kind of like irked that like, yo, why do y'all care whether this is, is that or, or the next thing? Mm. But the point being is, Regardless of how you feel about Israel and Israeli politics, whatever, the point being is if a country was guilty of something and the people who did it were held responsible, they were deposed, they were arrested, and they are facing trial uh, and might also be turned over to the, the International Criminal Court for it, then why are you making us pay for it? Like $335 million, it may not be a lot to the U.S., but it is a lot to Sudan. And I just feel like this is an example of him trying 
some last second shit to say, look, I created peace in the Middle East or whatever. And that's not really the case because we're not responsible for any of the friction. Um, but anyways, I digress. Uh, let's move on to good Lord bird. That's the John Brown show. The abolitionist. I love this show, man. I won't lie. First two episodes. I was like, okay, okay. And now this episode here had me dying, dying. Like just how John Brown acts, how Frederick Douglass acts. And I get it. It's fiction, but like, it was really well done. Um, let me ask you guys. First of all, let me let, so so everyone. You can let's start with what your favorite moment in the show was. Trey, what was your favorite moment in this episode? When uh, Onion and Frederick Douglass was getting loaded in the room. <laughs> first of all, that was hilarious. They was just throwing it back on the cognac, you know what I mean? But it, you know, obviously, just mixing it in and just seeing it that way, I thought it was fire. And then Onion is growing on me as a character, just because of the funniest shit that just be happening. And then Onion is basically Teflon. I like that. Uh, my Onion favorite sneaking the refills, <laughs> sneaking the refills while, while John Brown was getting it in. Yeah, they turn around and they just see Onion there with the bottle. Like uh. Onion spent like a week at a horse whorehouse and became like the most debaucherous you know, craziest d dude out there. Like, it was just one week, fam. Like, <laughs> holy hell, bro. Anyway, um, no, I think my favorite part was um, Onion's conversation with the dude that Frederick Douglass took in, the dude that escaped slavery down south and made it to Rochester to be at Frederick Douglass's crib because I think what the show was sort of illustrating in, in a really, I think, pretty subtle way about the different roles that people had to play in order to de defeat slavery in this country, right? Like, there's Onion who came straight from the fight, who's like, bruh, I do not want to go back. That shit is horrible. I'm staying up north. Um, there's Frederick Douglass, who is secretly getting money to fund the fight while not being on the front lines himself, but sort of being the liaison and being somebody that's connected to the Underground Railroad. Um, of course, there's John Brown, you know, this sort of white, righteous side of the argument, right? It's like he don't got no skin in the game besides just straight up like, I think this shit is fucked up and I can't b abide by this. Um, I just think this show, and then they're showing you the sort of that lady in the house. I forget her name. She had a really, Otelia? Or, or, she, yeah, um, Otelia. She, she sort of represented the passive white liberal who's like, I would love to see slavery be done with, but I, ugh, I don't want to get my hands dirty. Jesus, that's disgusting. I mean, if, the, if getting my hands dirty is what it takes, y'all niggas could be slaves forever. Fuck that. You know, I think it's dope that they show you the different factions and the different ways of being when it comes to, when it came to the fight of, of slavery in this country. I just thought that was dope. I love, I, and I love from the first three episodes which I always think is the most fascinating part um, of any slave narrative is how it parallels with what's going on today. And I think the lessons that you can learn is just the different roles that people have to play or want to play or the different ideologies that we see play out. Even with the, um, you know, the upended slave revolt from the episode before, right? They're showing you how treacherous the house Negroes are. <laughs> Candace Owens. You know, they're showing you how treacherous um, the passive white liberals are, which is like the preacher. They're showing you the different treacherous elements of all of it that sort of impede the progress of freedom and liberation for, for oppressed people in this country. And, and I think this show is doing a really good job of just kind of delicately doing it. I will admit I wasn't into the dude. Two things about the show that 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 um that I'm not crazy about. One, you know, the main character besides Ethan Hawke, who is doing an incredible job and like just thinking about him as Jake from Training Day and this yeah. and John Brown is just kind of ill to me. But the fact, because as we talk about with power, I think the show has a bit of a power problem in the fact that it's a young kid who's one of the main leads, and obviously he's not as good at acting as the adults are, right? And I think them trying to get him to talk in a um, 19th century slave voice is kind of throwing him off too. So that's kind of been troublesome, although I think he's doing a good job in trying to hold his own. But it's like we've seen it. Young kids just can't get busy like the older people can. And the Frederick Douglass dude, I don't know. Maybe they because like 
remember when we watched um Chernobyl, right? And the director was like, Yo, I told him just go with English accents, fam. Right, right, right. Talk how you talk. The story's gonna get how it gets. I think trying to get the actors to talk in that he, certain dialect is taking them out of it. I don't you know. know I, mean? I don't know. I actually liked him because it was like obviously it's a lot like the character he played in Hamilton. Like, oh, is that what is that where that dude is from? Yeah, he's from he, Hamilton. He's one of the dudes okay. from Hamilton. Uh, he, I, he played like okay. three characters in Hamilton. Don't ask me which because I, was, I got confused. Okay, okay, that piece of shit. But <laughs> but he was he was he did. I thought he did a good job, and I understand that it probably was done more for comedic purposes, right? Like the idea that, like you know, when he goes off on him for calling him Fred, like I am Mister Douglas, da, 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 da. and like Onion is like I don't know. 90% of the words that you just said. Uh, Jer, what was your favorite part of this episode? So why I snagged my uh, my favorite part, it was it was naturally, it was the uh, the whole dynamics between uh, Onion and my man when, uh, when Onion was about to escape or, or, or processing the thought, you know, of escaping. But um, I, I definitely thought, um, I thought the dynamic, that, that whole little scene where... Um, his, I, I mean, is that his wife? The 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 the, the white the, the white, white chick. Like, is, okay, so this is a line. This is a line. This is Anna Douglas, his wife, and uh, Otelia, his. Well, he's a king. They make their own rules. So basically, <laughs> it's his living jump off. Okay, so salute. By you know I mean, like the, a true yeah, black yeah, yeah, king, yeah. Jer. <laughs> 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 when 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 they both came in and you saw the different dynamics of them two, uh, like playing them, not playing them, but like basically doing what they feel as though they had to do in order right. to get him to do what they they want him to do or whatever, and just watching him be so like just with it, like you know what I mean, like whatever they were saying, he was like, yo, what? Like it, it kind of reminded me of the conversation we had last week where it was just like. Whatever he had to say at that moment to make sure everything was gonna go down, he was like, "Yeah, yeah, baby, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, <laughs> yep, no, I'm, 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 a, I'm a ride with him. Don't even worry about it. You know what I mean? So I, I thought, I thought that was pretty dope. But I'm over. Um, I actually thought it was pretty cool that Onion like got frustrated that he has to keep dressing like a girl because like, <laughs> it, you know, because it's easy it, now. It went, just be careful. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, no, I, I mean more so like because he. He had mentioned that, like, you know, y'all, I'm a boy and, and like, you know, or whatever he's hiding, whatever the case may be. But it was dope, like, watching him, someone, like, kind of peep it. I, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm fascinated that no one peeps that this is a boy. Like, like I, I love it. Time, like, it's does funny. look kind of androgynous. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he could pass for a chick if he really needed to, like... If you could Especially, imagine if they put the way, some lipstick on him, he got some soft features now. Pause. So, but but beyond yeah, beyond okay. beyond that, <laughs> you know what's funny is if you put someone in a dress and they don't have facial hair, and they're it's he's a child. Onion's supposed to be a child. Like at some point, you know, you've seen That's it. True. You've That's seen true. when someone has a baby, it's like, oh, what's his name? It's like it's a she. Like oh, okay. People so, who got kids who got short hair, they'll put a bonnet on it uh, on the child. To let people know this is a girl or to identify as such. So, like, it's not really that out of the question for everyone just to so it's, And remember, this is the 1800s. So, a 10 year old in a dress, like, why would I even question if it's a girl or not? You. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, like, he, the, the, the episode when, the, the episode before, I think, when they found that, like, when they were at the slave, well, they're all yeah. slaves, but. When they were at yeah, the yeah, yeah. at the whorehouse, and they all like they all they all peep, yeah they all peeped it off top, and then the, uh, my man from this episode peeped it off yeah. top. I don't know. I just find that whole dy- it was just cool to see him. The, I don't know, just like not just be the right. robot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, the other thing also you got to remember is it's a lot of people are making this mistake are white people, right? And white people, white people today already don't like look at black people really that's why we quote unquote all look alike because they don't really look at them they just go ah, I got someone black ah. now just imagine in the 1800s them niggas really didn't care like right. yeah it's a girl it's in the dress they see the dress before they see anything else am I the um, only one who gets nervous every time Onion gets around a man that they're gonna try to fuck yeah, like, yeah, I've been thinking that, right? listen, I, Every I thought Black time. Homie with the park was gonna try to blast for sure. I'm like, oh man, somebody about to try to fuck Fred this little homie. But also, yeah. I was yelling at the screen. I also was yelling at the screen. Onion, don't leave, don't leave. 
you <laughs> gonna you gonna be you gonna be up here, you know, uh, uh, like Chappelle skit. He said, "What's going on over there?" And he said, "Remember yeah. when the Bloomberg's fucking up skit?" <laughs> he said, "I done fucked up." Yeah, he yeah. was in the chains. Yeah. yeah, that's what it reminded me of. The thing that made me laugh. There's a couple. One was when they're at dinner and John Brown is saying saying. I guess a pre-grace. It's not even grace. He's saying grace. Son. And like everyone's like, yo, wrap it up, B. And then it's like, all right, we're gonna say grace. And old girl says, maybe onion should say grace. And Brendan's like, yes, yes, you say. <laughs> like, yo, just, I mean, I have a question. Do, do like is there are there any Muslims in your family who say really longer than normal prayers? Because I definitely not, have an aunt in my family who's that person who will drag the prayer right. way longer than it needs to be. But I don't not know if that's before, just a Christian thing. Not before we eat. Usually, if, before you eat, you just say Bismillah and then which Beautiful. is in, in the name That's of the God. That's the way it's supposed to eat. be. But here's the thing, because because you know, as Muslim, you do go, uh, you do uh, supposed to do five prayers a day, and like if you go either a to the mosque uh, for uh, Friday prayers or more importantly for Eid prayers. So when at the end of Ramadan and then there's two Eids a year, one of them happens at the end of Ramadan. You just spend thirty days basically not eating or drinking during the day. Like, you go to this prayer, and, like, as soon as this prayer is over, we about to go home and, and kill it, right? Uh, and the dude, the, the imam leading the prayer, decides he's going to use some really, really long verses. Because there are some quick verses we can use, and then there's some really long ones. Like, I'm talking about 10-minute verses. Uh, and so that's the big, like, the big thing. Even, like, during Ramadan, during um, um, Maghrib, which is sunset prayers, like you, you have a date and you drink some water and you've broken your fast and you go pray. And then you got the one imam who's like, yo, I'm going to I'm a flex my knowledge. And we're like, bro, we're trying to go eat, man. Like wrap it up, B. So that's the closest thing. But, but as far as like before mealtime, we don't really have that. Um, the other, so that when he's talking to Onion, when Frederick Douglass is talking to Onion, he says, how many in his army? And Onion says 10. And Frederick Douglass says, 10? 10? Ten? He just keeps saying that. like, that's not even a dozen. I How many are in his army? Damn near ten, I guess. Ten? Ten. You counted ten. Ten. That's not even a dozen. And then the other, the other thing that I like uh, that wasn't really funny, but it was like John Brown basically talking. And, and like you point out, Waz, a lot of this stuff has parallels to modern day where he says, hatred, greed, and fear are not a good mix. When he's talking about when Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. is like, how do you know what's good for a slave? Cause you've never been bought or sold or whatever. He says, "I don't, but I know, I know what the I've slavers seen feel that like." Evil in the slavers' yeah. eyes. And says, it's hatred, real. Gre hatred, greed, and fear are not a good mix. And that's, I mean, that's literally what I think what we're going through right now. And then the other thing he says is, "There will be no friendship with the slaveholding man until he is beaten and asked for forgiveness." And Frederick Douglass says that friendship is five generations away at least. And I'm like. Bro, someone needs to tell Frederick it's going to be a couple more at least. <laughs> going to be a couple more at least because some yeah. of them are still out here. For sure. And, here. And, and again, I'm somebody who actually enjoys slave narratives. I actually, like, I like reading about that time in history in the United States because I think there is a straight up through line between then and now, like uninterrupted line you can draw from then to now. And, um... And because I watched all of these episodes at the same time to catch up for today, um, I think it was episode two where, um, you know, the town where where they hung the, the people, the, the slaves that were at that whorehouse, uh, the, the, basically the, t the town judge was talking about this plot that they hatched, blah, 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 blah. They're going to kill white families. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Talk about the heinous evils that these people are going to do, right? And um, I remember I read this book called The Problem with Slavery in the um, Age of Emancipation. And it just basically chronicles how we got ourselves out of that crazy institution. And one of the things that stayed with me, and I think it stayed with me for a long time, was reading sort of the, the, the newspaper articles after there was a slave revolt, right? Like, they right. would... They would describe like, yo, can you believe they fucking did this and they burned this shit down and they did this and they did that. Like these people are monsters. And I remember thinking to myself, like, 
they're doing that in response to being enslaved. <laughs> and it reminded me of the rhetoric that's used after rioting and looting, after something right. horrible happens in America. It's literally the same, it, like the tone and the tenor that they would use in the papers after slaves revolted and committed some kind of violence. It's the same tone they use on the news after something horrible happens to black people and black people act out in violence with violent ways themselves. And that's why I'm always interested in slave narratives because it's, 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 it's like it's interesting to watch how it's all the same shit happening again repackaged. Signal and response, man. They, 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 they get surprised at the response and never ever think about the signal that they sent that, that elicited said response. All right. <clears throat> it's time to put uh, a cross in the dirt for Lovecraft <laughs> Country. Oh, thank God. This Jesus. motherfucker. I, like, I literally didn't take notes. I was just like, just end. It just, just, just end. end. Just end. Right. And and I want to say, look, I, I want to say, because we don't but need... By the way, to- quick, before, before you say that, let me just say, if you love Lovecraft Country, that's not a, a, a statement <laughs> on you. You Actually, no. on Wednesday's service with Naima Cochran and Karan J. Phillips, they love that show. And so if you listen to Bomb, if you subscribe to Bomb, Wednesdays, they go into it, and Naima's read the books, and Naima's got background. She's even explained some stuff to me. And I'm like, okay, now it makes more sense. I still think it's trash, though. <laughs> Waz, go ahead. Yeah, and, and we could talk about the achievements of the show just sort of uh, visually and um, uh, just stylistically. I thought it was a visually impressive show, just very well shot, very well done. Like, it had style. It had flourish. It looked amazing. It was visually arresting. That it, like and And I think that... In the sci-fi fantasy, I never know what the difference between sci-fi and fantasy is. Like, I don't, I, like, it's the same thing to me. But anyway, in whatever you want to call this genre, um, it's rare that we get, you know, this level of black sort of treatment when it comes to black themes and storylines and all of that, which is great, which is what we love. But I do think that's what's handicapping the show is that because they don't have a blueprint to draw from, they're trying to do all of these things at once that really, never really been done. Like, it's been done as shit like Get Out, you know, something like that you could point to, which is like some type of science fiction fantasy or whatever mixed into the story of the black plight here in America. But like, you've never really seen something like this done on TV before. And I think that's where the show struggled. And I think the reason why I hated the show is because I was constantly disoriented. Constantly. Like, really? constantly. You know, you know why I, I hated the no show? I had no idea what was going on. You know why I hated the show? One, bad writing, right? Like, it's one thing to have what you're talking about, a big concept, but not write it well. You're just like, and then this will happen. And then two... It's a lot of and in this show. Yeah, yeah. And then two, let's be honest. Can we be honest? Bad acting. Uh, Juicy Smollett's sister. Bad You think she's a show. bad actress? I think she's a good actress. In this actress. show, I've never seen her in anything else. She might be amazing somewhere else. In this show, and maybe... Maybe part of that is the bad writing. I go back I think to this it's with, the with material. I think it's the material. I think she, yeah, I go, she was I, pretty good. With the Star Wars prequels. Look, Natalie Portman's a great actress. She's trash in Star Wars, <laughs> but that's because the, <laughs> the, the, the thing that the she's asked to was not act there. out is right. not good. And so I was just like, yo, I can't. Like, she just overacts every goddamn scene. Same thing with Tick. Same thing with Michael K. Williams that I know is a good actor. But he's just every he crying in every scene. Michael K like, was nigga. taking the struggle of the black man. Sh- like oh. that man was wearing the struggle of every black man of the last thousand years <laughs> with, with, with him through every episode. You were so right yeah. about that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so so to me, that's the stuff. Uh, Jerv, I know you wanted to, to, to get some shots off over here. Yeah, I just don't understand. Um, I just wanted to put it out there. Like the show's just not good, right? Like. I get it. We 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 were thriving for the show. It came along during the pandemic, but you know, and my man broke it down to me. He told me, "Oh, you know, we don't have a lot of sci-fi uh, shows that star all black people." And I was like, "See, that's the problem right there. 
We're, we're, we're showing it love just because it has all black people. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to call a spade a spade. Shows just not, shows just flat out not good, right? There's no reason for the aliens to be in this thing at all. Like, right. it could have just had the, the drinking of the blood and the magic, but then, you, then like, much. you have aliens popping out the ground in episode one, or, or like one and two, you and then like episode, out you don't see them for I got a question. I mean, he gets to pet them, like, girl the crushed, uh, uh, Christina's windpipe and I was like why are you mad at her when the motherfucker that did it was like the cops <laughs> <laughs> and she just confused me I'm like they had to take the magic away from white people forever I don't know I don't know I mean this shit was heavy handed man <laughs> Jerv you had a, you had a question though you said you got one generic question you were trying to ask it in the chat and we asked you to save it for the show oh um Wow, what the fuck was my question? Come on, I mean, you know, short term yeah, memory I, is, is not I a know. strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 Damn, what was no. my question, like, dude? Oh, uh, no, we got to give Jerv a chance. Yeah, no, I got, Jerv, I got Jerv, Jerv, for just, 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 Jerv, just think on it for a second. Trey, uh, lasting memories of Lovecraft. I loved it. Loved it. <laughs> I might be the only person that really fucked with it like that, but you know. Thank you, overall, ass like, you know, tell, tell us what you love, though. I'm interested to hear um, why you loved it. So, I picked up the book actually, and I've been kind of just like attaching into it. And you know, I, I've always, you know, I've always been kind of on board because I understand it. I'm not trying to think too deep into it. Obviously, like Jerv said, that can be ran straight into the ground of like it's an all black cast and it's a black show, but it was shot very well. Um, I'm not going to do the Irishman on niggas and say, and lie to niggas after a year, say that that shit was fire like that. But like, <laughs> I get it. I get it for what it is. You feel me? Like it was a clash of a clash. Like if it would have just stayed in one lane and didn't have the sci-fi shit, I think we would have been fucking with it a little bit more. But once it adds some shit that you don't really fuck with like that, like Waz has made it very clear that he didn't fuck with comic books and shit and all but, that shit. And also <laughs> another thing that hurt the show, I watched Watchmen already. I watched them do it excellently. It, it wasn't flawlessly done, but they did an excellent job of weaving in all yeah. of the racial stuff and all of this stuff into the superhero stuff or whatever. I think that was way better done. <laughs> what was that noise, Jerv made? Jerv, Jerv, made Jerv you know, you don't, you ain't getting with with Watchmen. Nah, bro. There's a reason they didn't bring that shit what, back for I a mean, second can, season. What are you talking about? That was one of their <laughs> most successful <laughs> shows last year. Shit. Jerv is out <laughs> of his mind, man. What's wrong with this dude, yo? <laughs> I'm cool. Uh, all right. I'm cool to watch me, too. Enough Lovecraft shit. All right, guys. Let's, let's end it up with Benny the Butcher dropped the new album. Everybody, the internet went crazy. LeBron was rapping it, which is always a good cosign if yep. you're an artist. This may come as a shock to you, my co-hosts, and to the listeners. I didn't listen to it. I'm sorry. This is I'm one just, of the rare albums of mean that we'll talk about on here that I think you should listen to. Because it's okay. in the vein of early 2000s rock, early 2000s G unit. It's it's in it's got that feel to it. It 100%. And I think that's what Hit Boy who um if you're not if you listen to this, you're not familiar with Hit Boy. Shout out to Hit Boy. His name his name is not Hit Boy for no reason. This guy has done he's done joints with Beyoncé, Jay-Z, Kanye, Pusha, you name it. Some of the some of their biggest joints. Um, Hit Boy has credits on. He's he's an absolutely a super producer, extremely talented cat from here in Los Angeles. Um, and yeah, he did the whole project. There's a couple of joints in there that stand out. Um, let me see what I my favorite joints. I love Legend the outro. Uh, I love the joint with uh with with uh with with Gangsta Gibbs. That's one of my favorite joints as well. Uh, I'm about to tell you what my favorite shit is. I forgot the name of it already, but I tweeted it out the other day. Um, but War Paint? Not War Paint. Hold on, I'm about to tell you, Jerv. I'm about to find it. War Paint is crazy, by the way. Yeah, that that's shit the rocks. that's the shit with uh West Side with, with, with West Side Gun and um and Conway, yep. yeah, that shit is hard. My shit is yeah. trade it all. Trade it all is my shit. That's my favorite shit right now. Um, that shit rock. And yeah, and and I just think you know if you if you if you came up listening to guys like not to say he's on the level of Hov and Nas. That's not what I'm saying. But the Nas is the Hoes, the Az's, the G Raps, the, the 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 you name it, the Beanie Seagulls. You know what I'm saying? Like 
the guys that we came up listening to because they were so incredible with their wordplay, imagery, bravado, confidence. Um, I think Benny has it in spades, man. And to to do it over Hit Boy Beats is just crazy. Jerv, what did what did you take from the album? I know you was pumping this one. So, y'all know me. I'm a, I'm about the bars. Everybody you just named is uh, is somebody who I who I consider myself that I listen to and I yep. grew up on. Um, th- yo, this whole group is just amazing. Benny is by far my favorite. My favorite out the is Conway. No my favorite is Conway. I I think Conway is the nicest, but I Benny's just he's my just personality favorite, wise. Favorite one. I like yeah. Conway because he's yeah. like he's so crazy. Like he's the, he's always yeah. talking about like y'all smack the shit out of you. I'll do this. He's more violent. Yo, that's that why story, I like him. <laughs> that, that story Conway told about being at the Rock Nation yes. uh, party and. Shaking though, that shit yeah, was just yeah. crazy to me. Like shaking Beyonce's hand. And he didn't know if this girl was crying because yeah. she met Beyonce. Because I'm out of here, bitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like she just beat on the motherfucking man. Nah, like and that and then yo that that track he had with uh with oh, Ross. Beautiful. First, you know, I mean, you you knew Ross was on the album because you you know you you heard who was on it. But the second that track come on, you could tell up top, yo, this right. is a Ross beat. I so yo. I, I mean, shout out to Benny. The album's amazing. I need another project. But, yo, man, it's something about Ross. I don't know what this boy, his ear for fucking beats. But, like, the even the beat that he's on on the shit stands out from all the other beats on it. It's, like, different than the shits on the album. But the album, to me, is, is a, I mean, it's amazing. It's a masterpiece. Um, Benny's, Benny's on fire right now, dog. Like, Benny can't miss. Anything Benny's on, like, is... It's hot right An- now. Another you know I mean? thing this I want to say album. too, Jerry, because it's come up a lot of times on this show. Uh, Little Wayne is on this album and has a hot verse. <laughs> oh yes. He has a hot let, verse. Let, let, hold, let, yo, let, let me let me. I, I, you know what? It's funny. I was listening to it and I said, you know what? Let me let Trey know that Little Wayne he definitely he he he. This yes, it it ain't it ain't you know it ain't featuring Lil Wayne or no shit like that. But he can't ever get back to that because that's just an amazing right. time for him. But this is better than. Carter, yeah, Carter five, 87 rock yeah, and yeah, roll yeah, yeah. albums all that shit like he he had the better verse of the three cats on, on, I mean the other one was Big Sean didn't do too bad either though while I was on some real shit nah he did his thing he did his thing but again you know I'm not I'm not a Big Sean I think he said some shit but you're not going to Sean's yeah. flowing delivery is just off to me I, I like but he said some shit on there he said some clever shit he had some lines on there but definitely um Man, the, the the project is just dope, man. It's, it's just super dope, and I'm I'm happy to have it and to ride around with, man. I'm I'm gonna be listening to that, and I'm going to New York in two days, so I'm a I'm gonna definitely be in the streets bumping it. You know what I'm saying? You know, Scully on. You know what I mean? Me mugging cash. That's that's what's gonna be happening on Wednesday to this album, Jerry. <laughs> I ain't mad. Just make sure you throw your Tims on. Make sure you get Trey's Tims when he yeah, get out of the my dog. starter kit. You feel me? But listen, the weather ain't cold enough for me to listen to this album, but it's very 10 out of 10. Um, I'm glad that Jerry put some respect on, on Lil Weezy. He had grown-ass blood. You feel me? Because he got off on blood walk and time. That man's two for two. You know what I'm saying? And Sean did cool. My favorite joints on the album, uh, Timeless, um... War paint, man. Uh, where would I go? I even liked. Um, Thank God I made it. Which uh, Hit Boy said there was only two people that ever cried in the booth when he made a record: Nipsey Hussle when he made "Racks in the Middle" and Benny when he did "Thank God I Made It." Um, but the album is 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 flames, you know. Um, no bias. I think every coast is rocking with it. You know, Hit Boy's having a hell of a year. He got a project with Freddie Gibbs coming out soon, so. You know, he going to keep racking this shit up. But, you know, at, at this point, man, dog, I, I, I really enjoy it. I just have to get that real feel. Like Waz said, you know, hopefully I can hang on. And there's no, no other projects that I have to listen to. But when I get to the city and there's mad brick on my hands, you feel me? And it's 15 out and I see my wing, I see my breath come out of my mouth and I'm rocking this with the Pyrex okay. and everything. Don't don't you ain't you ain't got to worry about the fifteen degrees, bro. It, it ain't like that over oh. here no more. It's near nah, it don't get that cold fan. no more. Also, don't don't have no ashy knuckles out there, Trey. 
Nah, man. The, yeah, oh, but no, Trey no, no. stay listen. moisturized. Pause. Nah, so listen, know, listen. I'm it's gonna a different say, level. I'm gonna say, man. My hands. No, you do need to my, apply listen, a bit more, though. Listen, sure. my hands. My hands is is the upper echelon of moisturizing. You feel me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I might pay somebody twenty dollars just to moisturize my hands, family. Okay, yo, that's a that's a that's a Steve Stout. Move. That's a Steve Stout move right there. <laughs> yo, on that note, that's gonna do it for us here on Black Opinions Matter, motherfucker, B-O-M-M. Make sure you subscribe, like, rate, review, do all the good stuff. Remember, Mondays, Crazy Sexy Cool. Tuesdays, the show you're listening to right now. Wednesdays, Wednesday Service. Thursday, Woke Bros. Fridays, going up the same tray. Can you tell us who the guest going to be this Friday, or is it still a secret? It's still a secret. This dude with his secrets, man, I'll tell you. All right. Well, I'll holler at y'all next week. All right. Later, y'all.